All right. It's always good for business meeting night. We pick up a few extras. That's good. We're going to be a new book tonight, 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Last, last week we were in a part of 2 Chronicles because we were looking at Jehoshaphat, who was mentioned in 2 Kings. But Chronicles is focused on sorry, the kings of Judah. And the word Chronicles, is, you know, we get chronological. <laughs> chronology and... Uh, it basically means times, the times of the kings, the times of the kings of Judah, and there's going to be a mention tonight of the times of the kings of Israel, which we don't have that book. But anyway, um, we're moving into Second Kings tonight, which it used to be one scroll, uh, one combined kings, but the scroll was too big when you got both of those together, so they kind of split it at one time. And so it became first and second kings and first and second Samuel because you know those together makes a pretty long document. And uh, also uh, the book of Chronicles didn't used to be right after Kings. In the Hebrew Bible, it has it after Malachi. It's at the very end of the Hebrew Bible originally. <laughs> originally. So what we, uh, what we have is kind of a Adjusted, you know, it didn't used to have all of the chapters and verses and things like that. So things have adapted through through the times. Anyway, we're going to be in Second Kings chapters one and two tonight. One and two, and Second Kings starts with the deaths of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and it begins with their sons who are now reigning, and this particular son because. Kings points at the kings of Israel for the most part. Ahaziah is the son of Ahab that we're going to start with tonight. But anyway, we are in 2 Kings. 2 Kings covers three centuries. That's a lot of time that is covered in this book. And it goes through 16 kings from Judah and 12 kings from Israel. So there's a lot in 2 Kings. All right, starts off with Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Often you'd have a king that would be in charge, and after, when he died, these conquered, you know, they didn't go in necessarily conquer them uh, in the sense of destroying them. They just demanded tribute from them. And so sometimes when a king would die, these ones who were paying tribute would kind of rebel a little bit to see if the successor is going to have the stomach to keep doing what the uh, the father the predecessor was doing and so moab rebels and that's going to be mentioned more in chapters three and four in that part but anyway that's the first thing the first thing that is mentioned here in this this book and then it goes to ahaziah now ahaziah kind of a clumsy guy two left feet it says he falls through the lattice, falls through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. The kings, they, they had what other people didn't have. That's why David was up on his roof and looking down and got in trouble with Bathsheba. They had upper chambers, and often they would put lattice to help airflow and protect from the sun and things like that. He stumbles or something, he's probably drunk or something. I don't know what he was doing, but he falls through the lattice. And falls down to the ground and he is very much injured to the point that he is in danger of dying and so he has been actually fatally injured by this and so he is ill he sends messengers and he sends the messengers and says go inquire of Baal Zebub the god of Ekron whether I will recover from this sickness now his name means held by Yahweh, but his heart is held by Beelzebub. What does Beelzebub mean? Lord of the flies. Lord of the flies. They used to worship those flies. Can you imagine every time a fly goes, they praise you. You know, every time Hallelujah, fly. You know, worshiping the flies. That's what they did, and it was also uh, a name that meant. Uh, Lord of Medicine. It was kind of a God that would bring healing 
as well. So he sends messengers to go, and uh, and this God was centered in, in the Philistine area, Ekron. And so he's sending to the Philistines to try to find a solution for his illness that he's, that he's uh, happened to him because he felt it the lattice. You know, we, we are just one small step away from a whole different life situation. Just one little step. He didn't get up that morning and think, I'm going to jump through the lattice. Uh, we're just one step away from walking in front of a truck while we're on our little cell phones or, you know, these people that take selfies near cliffs and you know, I don't know how many people have fallen into the Grand Canyon because they wanted, hey, let's take a selfie and then they go through the railing or they, they slip and the wind blows them over or one driving off the road while texting. We're just, it's quick how it can happen. And all of a sudden, here is this king who finds himself mortally ill and he is sending help to uh, the Lord of the Flies. And believe it or not, they the reason they, this was the Lord of the Medicine also, they would drain the blood from flies because they thought it had healing ability. How many flies you gotta squeeze to get enough to make a medicine? They were actually doing this, squeezing the blood out of these flies. They used those maggots for uh, fly oh, maggots. Yeah, they used maggots, fly maggots? For, for eating dead flesh off of uh, Oh, for eating, yeah, the dead flesh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Baby flies. All right. It still goes on today, by the way, what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, well, we're not going to worship them, right? I don't care if they cure cancer. I'm not going to worship a fly. All right, well, the point I guess you could throw in here is whatever you turn to, in a moment of crisis, that's your God. Whatever you turn to in a moment of crisis. And here, Ahaziah, he turns to the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. And so he, he sends his guys to go and go to inquire of Beelzebub and ask him the question, am I going to die? Is this going to kill me? He's probably fallen off. He's got internal injuries and things like that. And so he is, he is hurting right now. He's wondering if he's going to ever bounce back from this thing. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Elijah is still out there. He's not going to be out there much longer, but he is still out there. The Tishbite, the angel of the Lord says to him, Arise and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now, therefore, says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And it says he, he departed, he disappeared. Well, the messengers, you know, here's, here, he, here Elijah is sent, and he comes with a question. <coughs> and the question is, is there no God in Israel? Is there no God in Israel? And that's a good question to ask sometimes. Is there no God? Is that the reason you are trying to handle this like you're trying to handle it? Is that the reason that in your crisis, in your difficulty, you are turning to what you're turning to? That you're turning to, uh, to money as your solution? In your situation, you're turning to lying or cheating? You're turning to, uh, to hurting people? I mean, is it because there's no God that you've chosen this route in your life? It's a good question to ask people when you, they're, they're really not where they should be. Oh, you're there because you don't think there's a God, I guess, because God would have been the first solution, I would have thought. And you never turned in that, in that direction. Well, that's the question that he asked them, and the messengers, it shook them up so much, they turned around and went right back to the king. They didn't keep going to Ekron. It says in verse 5 that they returned to him, uh, Isaiah, and he says, why have you returned? I know that you haven't had enough time to get to Ekron and back. You must know what's, what's going on. And they said, a man came up to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, 
Thus says the Lord, is there because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed you have gone on, but you, you have gone up, and, but you shall surely die. Ahaziah says, what kind of guy was this? He remembers a guy that kept showing up in his father's day, his father was Ahab. And they said, uh, he's a hairy man <laughs> with a leather girdle bound about his loins. And uh, Ahaziah said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Now, if I, if I meet a hairy guy in a girdle, <laughs> I'm really not going to stick around to hear what he's got to say. But this happened to be a guy that they knew of that ran around in this girdle. Uh, who was very hairy, and Ahaziah knew this was the thorn in the flesh of his dad, Ahab, and he decides to do what his, his dad never had accomplished, and that was try to catch Elijah. So in verse 9 it says, he sent a captain of 50 with his 50, that's 51 folks, to go out and catch Elijah. And they went up to him, and behold, he's sitting on top of a hill. And they said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah replied to the captain of the fifties, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. That was not a good moment. <laughs> but he finds him up on the hill. He, he actually starts off with, man of God. And and uh, orders him down from the hill. <clears throat> he says, if I'm a man of God. You know, I was reading this morning out of 1 Chronicles, uh, chapter 16, 22. And one of my favorite verses in scripture, it says, do not touch my anointed ones and do, and do my prophets no harm. Amen. That's a good bumper sticker. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, he basically saying, you know, if my dad's Hulk Hogan, why are you messing with me? If I am a man of God, shouldn't you kind of take it a little bit lighter? Because, you know, I think God would be interested in a moment like this. And so Elijah pulls out that, uh, that trick he used at Mount Carmel and calls down fire. Not on an altar, but upon an army. So the king, Ahaziah, again sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50. And this captain said, O man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. And he figures you just got to be a little more firm with these, these preacher types. And so he says, come down quickly, right now. Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him. And he's 50. So he, uh, he wanted him to come down. He got a barbecue. That's what he got. But he, he was uh, on the menu. So a third captain is sent with his 50. When the third captain of the 50 went up, he came and he bowed. He bowed down on his knees and he begged. and said, oh man of God, please there's that word my mom says always use. Please and thank you. Please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of 50 and their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. And while Elijah's thinking about it, the angel spoke to him and said, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. And Elijah arose and went down with the king. Ahaziah, you know, when we are in sin, it ripples out. And his sin and disrespect of God, just all that together, it cost 102 lives. Two of his captains and two of their, their 50s. And Elijah brought down fire from heaven. That was something God allowed him to do. But, you know, Jesus wouldn't allow his disciples to do that because when they were in Samaria, they wanted to bring down fire. 
In Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of. And sometimes we think that's a good solution, maybe. You know, God, why don't you bring down fire? You know, this, this city is as bad as Sodom was. Why don't you bring down fire on them? And God reminds us, you don't know what spirit that you're of. You know, we talked Sunday about that old man, that dualism that we've got going on. And Paul's saying, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I, that I want to do. And it's that, that law of sin, that principle that, that is within me. That that's always in operation. It's always available. And we are given the, the power of the Holy Spirit to live in victory over that. But it's always ready. And we talked about, you know, getting cut off in traffic. You, know, you get cut off in traffic, and there's this other you that steps up and says, you want me to handle this? I can take care of this. Let me tell you my plan. I want you to get right up on their bumper. And I want you to maybe honk at them a little bit. Let them know what they did. And you know that one finger that you've got? That's what it's there for right now. And that's the moment that you say, you know, I'm going to choose. Not that, but you, you're suggesting. I would have gone with that before. But I'm going to choose the Christ in me. I'm going to choose this moment to realize this person, they do what they do. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they're hurting right now. The best thing for them is somebody to be praying for them that has suddenly been thrust into their life. <laughs> the Christ in me would say, I'm going to lift them up in prayer. Or somebody, you know, does something else to you that's hurtful, that are lashing out in life, whatever is causing that. Or even they're a, a person that has grown to be this kind of person. This guy would say, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The Christ would say, the other cheek, the second mile. Find a way to love them in the moment. That's the new man that is in us. But the old one is always right there saying, I got this. I got this. Just get out of the way. I got this. You tell them, no, get away. I got this. the steering wheel in Christ's hands right now. You know, we can um, make choices to bring down the fire. But that's not the spirit we're of right now. We got a brand new spirit in Christ. Then he said to him, verse 16, Thus says the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel to inquire of his word? It's the third time we've heard that. Therefore you shall not come down from the bed which you have gone up, but shall surely die. And 17 says, So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah has spoken. Died according to the word of the Lord of the Lord. You know, Hezekiah recovered according to the word of the Lord when Isaiah came to him and he was dying and he was given 15 more years. And we'll see that later on in this, but 15 more years. In that 15 years, Manasseh was born, who was a wicked king, but he turned around at the end of his life and became basically doing some good things, but he had a son, Ammon, who was very wicked, only lived, I think, two years because of his wickedness. His court people killed him. And did that brought little eight-year-old Josiah to be the king. And he became the most godly king that uh, Judah had. But he would have never lived if Hezekiah had not been given those 15 extra years when he was mortally ill. Ahaziah chose a different route. He, he chose not to come to God in his illness, in his sickness, in his, his uh, the, what had happened to him in the fall. But Hezekiah did, and God responded differently with Hezekiah. But Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord. Things didn't change for him. And because he had no son, Jehoram, became king in his place. That's his brother, another son of Ahab and Jezebel. And the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. This is a weird circumstance where you've got 
Jehoram in Israel and Jehoram in Judah. Jehoshaphat named his kid Jehoram. Ahab named his kid Jehoram. And they just happened to both become kings at the same time. Jehoshaphat's Jehoram was actually co-regent co with him for a while, for quite a few years, for some reason. Anyway, uh, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And the rest of the acts of uh, Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel, which we don't got. We don't have that. We don't have the times of the kings of Israel that's different from first and second kings. Uh, anyway, chapter two. We'll go to this one real quick. And it's, it's interesting. This is a, an event that you are very familiar with. It came about that when the Lord was about to take Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. Now, there, was a, there was a school of prophets in Gilgal, Jericho and Bethel. He went to Elijah, who was probably running that school in Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he went down to Bethel. He gave him the option of not being his successor. <laughs> you know, you don't know what it's like, Elijah, to really be in the ministry. To follow me. They've been trying to kill me, Elijah. Are you sure you want? Why don't you stay here? I'm headed to Bethel. I mean, this is, my swan song is happening here. And if you, you come with me, God's, God's plan for you to follow me, is that something you really want? You know, Spurgeon, he said that if you can do anything else but be in the ministry, do it. God had not called you. God has called those who feel like there's nothing else I can do, Lord. This is the only thing that matters to me. So he's giving him an, an opportunity, but Elijah promises to stay with him to the end. The sons of the prophet who were at Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be still. You guys stay here. Elijah said to him, Elijah, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, they had all these prophet schools that were, were happening in different places. They approached Elijah and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Be still. And Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Three opportunities to stay. To step out. So the two of them went on. The 50 men of the sons of the prophet went and stood opposite them in the distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Counting the cost. Counting the cost. Jesus warned about building a tower. Count the cost before you start building something and get involved in something. The ministry that you're headed down, Elijah, are you prepared to go in that direction. And this is a time where the priesthood had gotten so corrupt that the prophets were the ones who were the spokesmen for God. And so they were always in the crosshairs of kings, especially wicked kings. Elijah had been called to the kings of the north, Israel. All of them were wicked. All of them were, were putting prophets and prison and wanting to have him killed and Elijah if he took over he would be the main spokesman for God against some very corrupt kings verse 8 says Elijah took his mantle which is his cloak folded it together and then he struck the waters of the Jordan and they were divided there and the two of them crossed over on dry land so Elijah leads the way. Elijah follows him on that dry land. Elijah continues with miracles all the way to the end of his life, that he had all his life here on earth, that he had. And when they crossed over, Elijah said to Elijah, 
Ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. Who does that remind you of? Solomon. Remember Solomon? Got that, the boy Solomon got that question in the night. You know, ask me what, what I'll do for you. And his, res his response was, I need wisdom to be a good king. And you know, the Lord said to him, because you didn't ask for the life of your enemies or riches and all of that, I'm going to give you what you asked for, plus those things as well. You know, how would you respond to a question like that from a person like Elijah? From, if you asked the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul asked you, what, do you, what can I give you? What, what would you like? Or Moses? Or Billy Graham? I'm about to go. What do you want from me? What can I give? Elijah said, please let a double portion of your spirit be on me. What would a double portion of Billy Graham look like on me? Wow. Um, or two parts of Paul on me. And Elijah said, Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Twice the spirit that God has used. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So this is a God thing. You, whether it happens or not, God's going to have to pull this off. And if you see this situation unfold, then that means God has said yes to what you've asked. The Hebrew phrase that he uses here is rendered like two shares. And it, it points to the firstborn son who would get twice the inheritance of the others, other sons in a, in a family. You get double the share. And so the language is kind of like, I want a double portion of spiritual inheritance from you. Um, he said, if you, if, you, if you watch me, that you'll get this. So I'm sure he didn't take his, his eyes off of him. But what's interesting is that when this double portion does come, because he did see him when he was taken up, that the Bible reports or records that Elijah did do twice as many miracles as Elijah did. He did kind of get that double <coughs> portion. But he was like the ten virgins that were waiting and their, you know, some of them oil that it, it burned out because they were not ready and prepared. Elijah was going to be prepared. He was not going to take his eyes off of Elijah. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elijah saw it, cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. He saw it. That means it's double portion. Well, I mean, what's a double portion feel like on you all of a sudden? It's like, well, what feels different? You know, when you come to, to be a Christian, you want to think, well, what's different? I still feel the pinch. Or, you know, what's changed? It's like it's, it's, it's God's got to start showing it in his own way, but you expect to get zapped or something, to feel something, hair on the back of your neck. You know, I just wonder if he was feeling it. You know, what happened? He's gone. You just saw that amazing uh, event of him being taken up, but that also meant for me, who's left here, I got that double portion because I saw it. He took hold of his own clothes and he tore them, tore them into two pieces. Why? Why does his clothes not matter anymore? Because he's got a mantle of Elijah. He took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah and fell, that fell from him and he struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? This is the first test. Elijah's last miracle is going to be Elisha's first miracle. And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elijah crossed over. So this chariot of fire, this guy who drops fire from heaven, a chariot of fire came down, took him up. Horses of fire took him up to heaven. 
So Elijah is now the guy. Verse 15 says, When the sons of the prophet who were at Jericho opposite saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Sounds like they're all in, but then they, they want a little confirmation. They said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let us go and search for your master, for Elijah. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or some valley. Maybe he slipped out of the chariot or something while it's heading up. And he's laying out there. You know, it's a pretty good fall. Maybe he got a little hot and he, oh, off he went. We need to go look for him. And Elisha said, you shall not send. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send. And they sent before 50 men, and they searched three days, but they did not find Elijah. He made the trip. He made it all the way to heaven, because he's going to be back, right? He's going to be back on that Mount of Transfiguration, and the two witnesses and Revelation. Uh, but they were, they were kind of Berean-like. They wanted to confirm this stuff, even though it looked good. Let's make sure. Well, they returned to him. And he was staying at Jericho, and they said, and he said to them, did, did I not say to you, do not go? I told you so. Well, the men of the city said to Elijah, this is in Jericho, Behold now, the situation in this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water's bad. The land is unfruitful. Remember that Jericho got cursed when, Jer when uh, Joshua came in. And even when it was attempted to be rebuilt, it was the curse was that the rebuilder would lose his children by trying when he tried to rebuild. And that happened. But Jericho seems to still be affected by the curse and, uh, and whatever else had happened when it was, it was defeated. And Elijah said, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. They brought it to him. He went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from, uh, from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. And the waters were purified this day according to the word which Elijah spoke. So his second miracle was to fix the waters at Jericho. Divide the waters, fix the waters. And the last part of this chapter, his third miracle was not so compassionate. He went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, young lads came out from the city. And John, you may want to close your ears here. Came out from the city and mocked him and said, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Man. These young teenager types. This is the same word that was used to describe Joseph. So it's an older. It's not like little kids coming out. But they came out and they started to mock him. They said, go up, you bald head. Um, the story, I'm sure of what happened to Elijah being taken up, was circulating. And here, Elisha comes in and uh, they come out and said, why don't you go up? Why don't you go up, bald head? And Elijah can't bear the cursing any longer. And he curses them. Or the mocking any longer. And he curses them. And two female bears come out and they maul these young men. Now, it doesn't necessarily say killed them all, 42 of them. But they got mauled. Maybe they got killed. It's not really clear whether they were killed or just mauled. But 42 of them. Now what does the law say when you've got delinquents that are causing havoc in a community? It says that if the parents can't get them under control, you take them out to the edge of the city. You know, our kids would get stoned you know, all the time here. They would have got stoned in a real way. You know, we have problems with kids on drugs and things. They would have got drug out there and got stoned in a different way. But that's what the law said, that uh, 
God kind of handled it by sending out a couple of bears to discipline these boys. Uh, but you would have thought that the story of the captain in his 50s getting burned up, that that would have gotten somebody's attention. That would have been a warning to them to kind of back off and not go after these men of God that were, were coming through town. But anyway, they were disciplined by the bears that came out of the wood. And there were 42 of them. And they, uh, I hope they bears took the hair off their head. <laughs> that would be rightful justice. So, uh, verse 25 says that he went from there to Mount Carmel. That's an interesting place to go. A place where Elijah had done what he did. And from there he returned to Samaria. Here you have this new power in his life. And he's going to choose how to use it and be hopefully as faithful. He, Elijah is going to be more public than Elijah was. Elijah had kind of been hiding until God spoke to him and brought him back in to the scene. But Elijah is going to be more around people, living around people. But he had this brand new power. You know, D.L. Moody was having a campaign in England and a pastor protested and said, why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's uneducated, inexperienced. Who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? Uh, another pastor rose and said, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. And that's the key, the secret. And that was Elijah's secret, Elijah's secret, and it should be Elisha's as well. Because that's the path he chose. He was given opportunity to not choose it, to go the other way, to stay with the other prophets. But he kept his eyes straight on Elijah until he received what God wants to give all of us, is that anointing, that ability to step out in the ministry that he calls us to and let that Holy Spirit have a monopoly on us so that we can live not with the guy that says to you know, honk and... and uh, cause havoc with people's lives, but the new us who has this ability to love uh, in an amazing way that only Christ can shed abroad in our hearts. All right, any, uh, any thoughts, any questions or comments? We said why or wow? I said wow. Oh, wow? Well, it's like